Let's talk about Euler's number E, which is approximately 2.7. Its defining feature lies in the special property of the exponential function e to the x. You see, the slope of e to the x at any point equals the value of the function at that point. While this is quite a mouthful, it can be illustrated in a neat way. First, the slope at any point can be found by first drawing the tangent at that point and then adding this triangle, with the horizontal side having length 1. The slope is then simply the vertical length. Now, the special property of the exponential function is that its slope precisely equals the height of the graph, which is true for every single point on the graph. This property can be used to define e, as there is no other number with this feature. That's all fine and good, but ask yourself whether you expect this constant, or this function, to be connected to prime numbers. You'd probably assume that they live their life in separate areas of mathematics and don't relate to one another. At least, that's what I thought until I was amazed to find out that Euler's number shows up quite frequently when studying the distribution of prime numbers or the visibility of integers in general. I mean, there is no apparent reason why this curve should show up when dealing with prime numbers. Probably the simplest question in number theory, where the solution is connected to Euler's number, is the following. Consider all numbers from 1 to, say, 100. Obviously, some numbers, like 48, have many devices, while others don't. A natural question to ask is, how many divisors do the numbers from 1 to 100 have on average? Even though the task is easy to understand, coming up with a reasonable guess for the average is, well, tricky. And right now, nothing indicates that the answer is connected to Euler's number. So, the general question we will tackle is to find a formula which approximates how many factors the numbers from 1 to n have on average. I love this problem for three reasons. First, everyone knows what divisors are, making it not only a simple question to understand, but also many people have at least some sort of intuition for it. Second, it shows how very different fields in mathematics can work together. In this case, number theory, which often deals with studying prime numbers, an analysis, where Euler's number was born. Last, every single step of the solution can be visualized easily, therefore avoiding dry calculations and making it more accessible. That being said, let's dive right in. So we can count for each integer its factors. As an example, for every number from 1 to 10, the number of factors is listed. Note, prime numbers are easy to spot, as they only have two factors, namely 1 and themselves. As our goal is to understand how frequent divisors are, let's start by getting a feeling for how common factors are and visualize this number of factors. For instance, if 6 has 4 factors, we get the point 6, 4. Doing this for every number, we end up with this wonderful picture. When zooming out, the pure chaos behind the number of factors becomes apparent, and this chaos alone certainly cannot be captured by a simple formula. So let's address our main question of how many divisors a number has on average. As a start, say we want to find the average number of factors the numbers from 1 to 10 have. Well, we get the average by computing the sum of the number of factors and dividing it by 10 equaling 27 over 10, or 2.7. Hence, a random number from 1 to 10 has an expected number of factors of 2.7. Doing the same for the first 5 numbers, we end up with 10 over 5, or 2. Again, as we want to understand how these averages grow, let's visualize them. We have the point 10, 2.7, the point 5, 2, and we end up with this rather smooth growth, which makes sense, as taking averages decreases variance. Simply to make the graph look prettier, I will connect these dots and then zoom out once again. Well, wow, suddenly the chaos from before disappears completely and we end up with this almost perfectly smooth curve, representing the average number of divisors. If you're anything like me, you just have to know what this curve is and why it appears. To unravel this mystery, we have to take a step back and come up with a new way of counting divisors from 1 to n in a systematic way. Take for instance 10 and its 4 divisors. Sort of the reason why they are factors of 10 
is that each of them has a counterpart, such that their product equals 10. Put differently, there are exactly four ways to write 10 as the product of two natural numbers. As we now deal with pairs of numbers, we can start plotting them in the xy plane. So as 1 times 10 equals 10, we get the point with x coordinate 1 and y coordinate 10, and similar for the other three points. Notice we are visualizing whole number solutions of x times y equals 10. As this equation can be rewritten as y equals 10 over x, we can also plot the graph of this function, which happens to be a hyperbola, going through our four points. Importantly, these are precisely the integer lattice points of the hyperbola, as these correspond to pairs of numbers whose product is 10. If we now continue plotting the hyperbola 9 over x, we see that there are precisely three points on its graph with integer coordinates, namely 1, 9, 3, 3, and 9, 1 corresponding to the three divisors of 9, namely 1, 3, and 9. For 8 over x, the hyperbola goes through four points, corresponding to the four factors of 8, 1, 2, 4, and 8 itself. Continuing this procedure, we end up with every single whole numbered point on and below the original curve, corresponding to every factor of every number from 1 to 10. Here one should point out that we already computed the average number of divisors of a number smaller than or equal to 10, which was 27 divided by 10, where the 27 counted all the divisors of all numbers from 1 to 10. As we are now precisely visualizing those divisors, it makes sense that they are precisely 27 points below the original graph. This encourages us to ask a new question. How many integer points are below a given hyperbola? So, is there a formula describing this quantity? At first, there is not really a clear way to count such points, as a more common question is to ask about the area below a given graph. With this in mind, let's squarify the points. Let's add for every point a square with side length 1, which is directly below and to the left of the point. As all these squares have every 1, the total area they have simply equals the number of points. Unfortunately, this area still isn't easy to compute. So, let's make two simplifications. First, we get rid of the first column, and second, we add this extra strip on top. Admittedly, we thereby change the total area. However, doing the same for, say, the first 30 numbers, we see that the error created has only a small effect. In other words, in the long run, this simplification does not change the result, as the percent error tends to zero. Going back, the number of factors of a number smaller than or equal to 10 is now approximated perfectly by the area below the curve 10 over x from x equals 1 to 10. And well, this can be computed by this integral. So suddenly, we have to use calculus to answer the simple question of how many factors a number has on average. Cancelling the tens, we end up with the integral from 1 to 10 of 1 over x dx. You might guess correctly that by replacing 10 with any whole number n in general, we arrive at the result that the number between 1 and n has about this many factors, again, where the percent error goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. So how can this integral be computed? Well, we have to look for a function whose derivative equals 1 over x. It's now time to introduce Euler's number as the star of this video. So, a number below n has on average this many divisors. In order to compute the integral, we have to find the function whose slope at any point x equals 1 over x. The mysterious function that we are looking for has to look something like this. It has to have at x equals 1 a slope of 1, at x equals 2 a slope of 1 half, at x equals 3 a slope of 1 third, and so on we get something that looks much like the graph of e to the x we had in the beginning, but somehow flipped. More precisely, the x and y axis seem to have changed place, hence everything got mirrored along the 45 degree axis. So maybe we shouldn't focus on the equation e to the x equals y, but instead e to the y equals x, therefore switching x and y. This means that y equals the logarithm of x, or more precisely, the natural logarithm of x, 
as it has Euler's number as basis. Last, we need to check that the slope of log x indeed equals 1 over x. As an example, why should the slope of the tangent at x equals 2 be 1 half? Well, first, the two dotted lines of the exponential function have the same length, in this case 2, as we saw in the beginning. This translates to these two dotted lines of the logarithm having equal lengths. If we now rearrange the sides and shrink the triangle by a factor of 2, we indeed get 1 half as a slope. The same holds for every point. For instance, at x equals 3, we now have dotted lines of length 3. And after rearranging and shrinking by a factor of 3, we have shown that the slope is indeed 1 third. Picking off where we left the integral, we now know that it equals log of n minus log of 1. Looking at the graph of the logarithm, we see that log 1 equals 0. So we can omit that term in the answer. Therefore, we have proven the numbers from 1 to n have on average log n many factors, where the percent error tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. One way to rephrase this result is that the graph of averages from before should be approximated by the logarithm, which as we saw is just the mirrored exponential function. As an example, we computed that the first 10 numbers have on average 2.7 factors, while log 10 is 2.3, so a relative error of 17%. The numbers from 1 to 100 have on average about 4.8 factors, resulting in a 5% error. But when considering n equals 10,000, the error is already 1.7% and tends to zero as n increases. So what's the takeaway of this problem? First, I think one should realize that even the simplest questions, like asking how many devices a number has, can have solutions that are quite surprising. And second, visualizing every step of an otherwise dry calculation can often give a much better feeling for why a certain result is true and also show the beauty behind mathematical proofs.